what an interesting show we have this weekend. Eileen Burmeister from Arizona Public Service is our guest, and what a terrific storyteller she is. She is, Jay, and I think what she uh, was able to share with me was this idea that you can be a storyteller and a great storyteller with just about anything. I mean, her ways of approaching what she does is a regulated utility uh, in the power business. She's not talking about electronics coming down uh, pipes, but what she's doing with internal communications, with working with a variety of different teams in the, uh, the organization to tell stories and then measure the success of those stories was really, really intriguing. Yeah, it was a good one. I mean, you think, oh, Social Pros episode with somebody from an u- electric utility company. How interesting is that going to be? Oh, what a great show. And she, it was one of my favorites, yeah. Yeah, it was. And, and what she talks about, too, on, on getting all the people in the company involved. So there's certain things that corporate can say, certain things that corporate can't say because of the regulated nature of their business, as you pointed out. And they're so good behind her leadership at getting actual employees all around the state of Arizona participating in social. Uh, it is a really interesting episode and a good balance this week of of kind of strategy and tactics. I think you guys are going to like this episode with Eileen Burmeister from APS. First, before we get into the show, acknowledge this week's sponsors. Our friends at Salesforce Marketing Cloud, who have the eternal wisdom to employ Adam Brown, are, of course, underwriting the show. Thank you for your years of support. You know, social media in B2B can be tricky. Uh, it's, it's not as obvious as it sometimes is in B2C. And that's why Adam and his team have created the guide to social media for B2B. It's really comprehensive and quite useful. It talks about what channels to use, what messaging to use, what KPIs to use, how to allocate your budget, what to do about paid uh, for B2B social. All those things are important. You should download it for right now for free. And actually, this might be your last chance because we're going to have new stuff from Salesforce to talk new to you stuff about coming soon. Yeah, in the next week or so. So if you haven't downloaded this guide, you should probably do it this week. Go to bit.ly slash social B2B guide. That's bit.ly slash social B2B guide. That's all lowercase. And you can put that in your hands right now. Also this week, the show is sponsored by our friends at socialmedia.org, an organization that Adam, you've got experience with. I have. Um, I was lucky enough to be a charter member of socialmedia.org, both when I led social at the Coca-Cola company and at Dell. And it's a fantastic organization. Andy Cernovitz and the entire team over there do such a a great job. What I liked about it, Jay, personally, was not just the insights of having this kind of trade organization for us as social pros, but more the interactions I could have with like people. I could have the same type of discussions with people who are going through the same deals, the same challenges, both internal challenges of measuring and and making sure your executives understood kind of what you were doing, as well as external challenges. How do I deal with Facebook on this topic? How do I deal with with constituents on on these types of things? All of those are a big part of the socialmedia.org organization and the, the friendship and membership aspects of it. If, if you're in charge of social for a medium-sized or large brand, you absolutely positively need to look at socialmedia.org. It will truly change the trajectory of your career. A number of people who have been on this show are members of socialmedia.org and more all the time, including perhaps you. What I'd like you to do, if you feel like you can uh, qualify, and they, it's a fairly rigorous screening process, but if you feel like this is for you, go to socialmedia.org slash socialpros. That socialmedia.org slash social pros, fill out the form, they'll get back to you. Uh, and I hope it works out. You'll, uh, you'll be the richer for it. And now, without further delay, this week's episode of the Social Pros Podcast featuring Eileen Burmeister. Eileen Burmeister, social media consultant for Arizona Public Service Company, otherwise known as APS, the lady with all the electricity. Welcome mm-hmm. to Social Pros. Thanks for Thank being here. Thank you. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about uh, APS and, and its scope of services, uh, just so we can frame it up for listeners here of the Social Pros podcast. 
Sure. APS is a um, the, one of the electric companies for the state of Arizona, and we uh, energize all areas throughout the state in little pockets. So we also work with some other smaller utilities that are just in smaller rural areas, but then um, SRP is another company that provides service as well. But we are the primary and the biggest electrical provider in the state of Arizona. We also own the largest um, nuclear plant in the nation, Palo Verde. So they uh, um, are out in west western side of Arizona, and um, there are um, one of our largest contributors to our grid of the electricity that we give to our customers. I know that you are are similar to many other companies in that you have a multitude of folks involved in social media in different elements, right? So, mm -hmm. so your team does, I guess, what we would consider to be organic social, mm -hmm. which we talked about here on the show. Other folks do paid, other folks might do customer service. Can you talk through a little bit those, those relationships departmentally and, and how that all comes together? Yes. So we do have a relationship with customer service where we uh, work hand in hand with them. We own the channels, but on a quarterly basis, we go and help them with training for messaging, making sure we're all on brand. Could we have a brand set of standards, not only um, what we look like, but what we sound like. For example, we try to stay away from the word we are proud. We want to make sure that we're giving pats to the people, the customers on the other end, not ourselves. So there's certain word choices that we're very strategic about, and we try to let our customer service reps to know what those are so that we're all preaching from the same choir sheet. So that's one way that we do is we have um, the ability to see what the other folks are doing. So in customer service, we have a tool for us that triages the comments as they come in. And anything that's stakeholder specific or um, outside of the realm of customer service, they triage our way and the rest of the 85% of the interactions they take care of. But we still have eyes on them and can provide coaching as needed. We also, because we're all over the, the the whole state, we have what are community affairs managers placed throughout the state. So there might be somebody in Prescott and somebody in Flagstaff, and their role is to work with government uh, leaders there, with county leaders, with elected officials, with um, uh, what, um, any kind of small business owners that would have a vested interest in what our company can help them with. And those folks have a branded account with APS underscore and then their handle. So they're out there talking specifically to those audiences in those small corners of Arizona. But we also have some here in the general greater Phoenix area that do that as well. And that allows us to have more of a micro audience and a targeted audience in that specific area. So if we have an outage, say, in Goodyear on the west side of Phoenix, the community affairs manager, also known as a CAM, can tweet that out and then we can choose or not to choose whether we um, amplify that from our channel. From a corporate standpoint. From a corporate standpoint. And yeah. so, for example, if there's a small outage in Prescott, we might not want to say that from the brand because our audience is not just Prescott. It's largely but, not in Prescott. Right. But we can tap Darla, who's the community affairs manager, and say, hey, can you tweet about the outage? And she does so. So... Another way that that's been really fun this Christmas is we've had over 20 electric light parades all across the United States. Or, sorry, all across Arizona. I'd like to own all the United States, but I don't. <laughs> um, so each different function, the community affairs managers are part of that. And so they're taking pictures and doing that. And of course, we're amplifying that because it just, it tells the story of how we're in every corner of the state, not only providing electricity, but providing funding for uh, nonprofit forums. We're helping with chambers of commerce, all of that. So uh, last week, we, employees joined together with some of our community partners and everybody donated $60 per bike. And we adopted an entire kindergarten class of 72 children and surprised them with bikes. So we were able to do a video of that, put it on social and all of our community affairs managers then share that out as well. It was fabulous. People were crying. It was just everything a social media person. I like to make people cry in a good way. Not a bad thing. <laughs> that's that's, that's going to be the headline of this episode, how to make people <laughs> cry in social media. I think my husband would agree. <laughs> I've already got it written here. That's terrific. Yes, yes. Uh, do those community affairs managers, are they only on Twitter or are they on other channels as well? They are primarily on Twitter. There's a few that are comfortable on Instagram, but not all of them are. Our only ask of them right now is Twitter. And the reason we do that is because each channel has a specific purpose. And when it comes to outage communications, we pretty much drop everything and go to Twitter. And they're primarily there to help with any kind of outages. So um, that's primarily where they exist. We don't really ask anyone from our company to play on Facebook because that's more personal 
personal channel for them. So if they want to go share what the brand is posting, that's fine. But primarily it's um, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram that we're asking different people. We're moving forward with thought leadership this next year, and that'll primarily be with LinkedIn. But then we have some folks who just live on Instagram solely, and so we'll leverage them there as thought leaders as well. And in that instance, because Instagram is so centric on an image telling the story, we'll do a lot of restoration photos. So we'll have people who are in the T&D transmission and distribution um, that are just out there showing our trucks up, up or a person up the pole putting power back to whatever they do. Putting power back together, I think that's the technical term. Um, this is why I'm in communications and not up a pole somewhere. Um, so that's our ability to then tell those stories just through a single picture here and then through a tweet over here and then a LinkedIn thought piece or something like that. Eileen, I want to go back to uh, something you mentioned, which was the triage, because I think that's something that a lot of our listeners have to do. You've got multiple teams and departments that are interested in what right. your customers are saying, right. but who's the right person to hear that, to take action upon it, perhaps even to respond. Yeah. So if you could walk us through how you're doing that and is everyone kind of using the same tools and do you kind of have a nomenclature for how you, how you pass you know, a potential tweet that needs to be responded yeah. or actioned upon throughout yeah. your communications organization as well as customer service. Right, so customer service, we rely on them heavily to run that up their chain of command. So if there's an issue, for example, but we kind of uh, watch each other's back. So let me explain that this summer, somebody was saying a certain neighborhood was having a few outages over and over again. And we started noticing that on social and the term we like to use around here is a lot of times we're the canary in the coal mine. We're the first mm -hmm. person to raise our hand and say, we have a problem over here and nobody else has heard about it. So customer service saw that and they we saw it and both of us ran it up our chain of commands and it got to where it needed to be where somebody could actually affect the change and it turned into some meetings in the community with that neighborhood it really brought it to the attention of the people who could fix the problem um, otherwise what we're what we always want to stay away from is just having that stuff you know no response necessary and then it just goes by the wayside and then you've got a real problem so we try to nip it in the bud as soon as possible and we handle and this is our training to them we handle um, really company specific anything that's messaged about the company, politics, um, if it has to do with community, uh, ways that we're involved in the community, we handle all of that. And then anything customer centric about my bills getting higher, um, my power's out and I don't know what to do, customer services manage that. So we kind of just keep an eye out for one another and say, hey, you guys missed this and we'll kind of talk back and forth. So if, um, for example, if they had missed that one about the multiple outages, then I can pick up the phone and give them just a coaching where I'm just able to say, hey, let's make sure we button that up so that doesn't happen again, because a lot of times we are the only people who are seeing that there's a problem out there. I recognize you're in a regulated industry. Mm -hmm. uh, so that means you have kind of a political side involved. You've got legislatures at the state yeah. and the city level. They're involved kind of in, in your business, yeah. uh, pun, pun intended and not intended there. <laughs> yes. Have you as a communications person kind of identified who those people are on social media? So if yeah. you have a legislator that's tweeting out about a rate increase, either pro or con or something like that, that it's, you're alerted and your team knows kind of how and where to respond. Yes, and we work hand in hand. Actually, our cubicles are right next to the media team. And then we have a close relationship with the government affairs department as well. So there's a line of sight between all of us as to what's happening. And we have chosen uh, at various uh, instances on political issues, sometimes we get guidance from our legal team and government affairs like don't even address it. Um, if we have an independent expenditure stood up for a certain issue, then we don't address it at all. The, the repercussions then is that it, ro it shows up in your sentiment scores, obviously, because you're really not interacting, but um, there are legal reasons that we don't interact at those times, which is hard for a social media person because it's hard to have, you can imagine if somebody said something bad about you and your inability to say anything back, but in this instance, um, in, in in the political climate we're in right now, there are times where we're just hands off. And then we rely on other people in the company and allow them, if they want to, then we give them the messaging they need to go out and say the things that we can't really say from the brand. Does that make sense? It definitely does. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, Burmeister, 
who is the social media consultant for Arizona Public Service Company, Electric Utility in Arizona, joins us this week on Social Pros. Eileen, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. It was a question I wanted to ask about employee enablement in social. Mm-hmm. You have many, many, many employees, many of whom are fixtures in their local communities around the state of Arizona. And so when that happens, either officially or unofficially, uh, something that maybe corporately you can't communicate, but as an individual employee of the organization, you can. Do you you send them messages using some sort of software? Do you send out an email to all employees and say, hey, we can't say anything, but here's what you can say? Or, or do people have to be uh, trained or approved or somehow vetted before they can uh, do that kind of social media communication as an APS employee? So we do provide, um, not specific, not that specific, but we do provide trainings, whether it's, we have an internal intranet that's very vibrant and has daily news going on. And so a lot of the messaging around a certain topic, there will be a section of the internet that's devoted to talking points for that. It's not as specific as saying, here's what you can say on social, but it's just informing them of what, a lot of times it's just a discussion they're having in the grocery store aisle and they have their APS badge on and somebody says, hey, how do you feel about solar? And we want, the employees are saying, we need to know what our answer is because I work in accounting. I don't know how we feel about solar. So they want those talking points and we provide those. Um, We also, so I do some articles for Newsline, which is our intranet, just the best practices. Here's what you want to interact with. Here's what you want to shy away from as far as like, if, if there's an argument that's breaking out and it's gone back and forth more than twice, that's probably not the platform for it. So maybe you can have coffee or maybe if you don't know them, you can just back out it gracefully or whatever that looks like. So providing those kinds of tips and guidance, but also um, I do... Uh, coaching with employees as well. If there's an issue, I always assume good intentions. I'm assuming that they're just wanting to stand up for the company. I'm not calling them like to blow a whistle and say, hey, you know, this is social media police, but basically I know what you're trying to do. Let me help you do that a little bit better. And here's something we've learned from other employees interactions that might help you so that it's not as contentious as that last interaction or something like that. So Um, great. And then we also have an ambassador program that we've had for the last, I think it's been about six or seven years. And those are a group of employees have basically raised their hands and said, I really want to be an ambassador, whatever that looks like in the community, um, whether that looks on social, however you want to use my voice in the community, I'll, I want to be that. So they have, we do monthly sessions for them on certain topics. So for example, next month is going to be on um, battery storage, everything you want to know about battery storage. Well, not every employee wants to know about battery storage, but these are the folks who are like, I do want to learn about every corner of our business so that I can actually talk intelligently about the work that we do. And so those folks we lean on very heavily as far as really nudging them with an email and saying, hey, this issue is cropping up or this, this, um, this is something that's being misunderstood across our social channels right now. We just want to provide you with the facts and feel free. And I always preface it with, if you're comfortable, I mean, we basically are not telling people to, but just kind of giving them the tools they need if they want to engage in that. And of course that becomes an issue with um, next door because we don't have a presence in next door. So then those conversations crop up and we'll have employees that'll say, Hey, can you jump in there and say something? And we have to educate them and say, we can't as a brand jump in there and say something, but you can. And if there's anything you need from us to help you do that, feel free to reach out. Is that a corporate policy to not be on Nextdoor? Well, no, it's just um, we haven't been able to, because of the way, I think it's the way it's set up across the board, yeah. the company can't have a seat unless they choose to advertise. Yes. So that's what we're looking at now is- um, Whether, What's the balancing act of that? Yeah. Right. Is there a return on investment for doing that in order to get the comments and the ability to talk with the people who are having the questions that are, they're not understanding? Because, you know, it's just, it's easy to think when you do this every day, you just think, oh, people just don't know what they're talking about. Well, how much do you know about your water company? How much do you want to know about? You don't want to know. You just basically want to know what's in it for me. And that's not a selfish response. That's just how most people think about their electric. They want to go turn on the light and the light comes on. And beyond that, they don't really care about the weeds. And our employees tend to go really into the weeds. And so we try to give right. them that upper level messaging where you're like, come on back out of that little cave you crawled into yes. and let's just yeah. talk at the level that people care about. So. Yes, you're informationing people to death and yes. more than they want. You, you lost me at battery storage, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There's my case. 
I do want to kind of go back to that next door example, because I think it's, it's an interesting one. Mm-hmm. We all know that you're in a regulated industry, but I'm my curi- this is more of a personal curiosity. Are you as regulated as, say, the healthcare or fence where there's a need to capture and log all posts? I'm going kind of to that example of you have ambassadors that are out there. They're speaking mm-hmm. on behalf of your organization. They may be on next door because they're actually representing their neighborhood there. And they're also right. an APS employee. Right. Is there any requirement for them to kind of log and track or take a screen grab of any communications they may say as kind of a pseudo spokesperson for APS? No. And we're very, very careful to tell them they are not speaking on behalf of the company. So we train them in a way that says, make sure we act, actually encourage them all to use a hashtag, I work at APS. And that's for our legal team is to self-identify right off the bat. Because if you go in there and say something and someone kind of digs into your profile and is like, well, sure, you can say that because you work there, then it seems like you're being sketchy. So we like to present up front, like give your point and then do hashtag, I work at APS. And if they want to continue to interact with you, great. But primarily we'll say to them, hey, if don't ever, um, don't ever speculate on social channels, if you don't know the answer, then don't say anything. So if somebody says, hey, there's an outage in Goodyear, how long is that going to last? And you go, well, I've heard it's going to be five hours. Don't do that. And we've had people do that where we have to rein them in and go, okay, you, you're not speaking for the company. Because then what happens? It goes six hours and people lose their mind and you can't blame them because, well, this guy told me it was going to be five hours. So, um, but then the other thing we do is just uh, – Say, you know, if there is something specific and you think you know the answer, make sure you clear that with communi- corporate communications before you go out and say that. We just don't want people going rogue uh, because there's a whole media team that's here and social media team that work together to do that. And we don't want any kind of definitive message coming out from our employees that hasn't been vetted. So in that case, um, it's not that they need to capture their activity because they truly aren't speaking for the company. They're positioning themselves as an employee of APS. So instead of hashtag I speak for APS, it's I work at APS and this is my, these are my thoughts. Adam and I are going to add the social pros host hashtag to our social media communications so that when we promote the podcast, people know. Hey, I host, I host the, yeah, social pros. It's a little long. You can work on it. It's it's a lot of letters. We got to shrink it down. We'll work on it. We'll put our best people on that. (laughs) What one more thing, Eileen, that you brought up that was interesting to me was in and around sentiment uh, Mm -hmm. and certainly the sentiment of those employees that are speaking on behalf of your organization could impact positively or negatively. But recognizing too, that you're a commodity, uh, as you said, nobody really cares when they turn the light switch on or off, who created those electrons, uh, that the electrons happen to be there. How in your industry do you kind of measure success uh, and performance, not just at the the kind of macro level, Mm -hmm. but also the individual kind of social performance level? Are you talking about sentiment specifically? I, I'm assuming sentiment is one of the many myriad of, of tools that right. you need to kind of measure your performance day to day, week to week, year to year. Yeah. So right now we actually, uh, with the help of Convince and Convert, have come up with our goals for 2019. Nice plug. Um, hey, oh, <laughs> hey. And we're going from, um, we used to do reach, engagement, and sentiment. We're switching it to audience, which is kind of the same as reach. Engagement, we're keeping engagement and tone. And to, to your point, we have incredible stories of things we're doing in the community that are positive, they're shared quite regularly, and we're able to boost those when they're doing well to get even more traction. But there are certain waves that come with negative sentiment that you can't counterbalance. So uh, we found ourselves being a gauge for social media um, on sentiment, and that's a tricky place to be because a lot of people want you to you know, hold back the wave and it's kind of a a dance that's really hard to do. Um, So I don't know if that answers your question, but when it comes to uh, pushing positive stories, we're very strategic about that, especially during those times of not only just whatever's positive, but specific to what the issue is at hand. If we are having a lot of outages, talk about the work we do around reliability so that people know all of this work went in for the nine months up to monsoon season to make sure that we had fewer outages than we're already experiencing. So it's kind of just changing the narrative and doing a lot of storytelling around what's happening behind the scenes, but at a level that they will actually care about. A lot of times that's, we have the benefit and a huge blessing of having an incredible videographer on our staff who came from the TV industry. She knows how to run production. She knows how to run a board of stories and all of that. So she's able to see a story or an idea and be like, that'd be better in video than it would be in story and able to 
choose which way we want to go because people are more apt. We can just watch the numbers. They're more apt to watch a short 30 second video than, than some kind of article that you're going to link to. I was going to say that, that you really are terrific at, at showing, not telling. I, mm -hmm. I know more about this than, than we expect because we, you guys are a client of ours. Thank you. Right. But it, it really is terrific. And one thing I wanted to ask you, and I just don't know this part of the, the, the tale very well. Of course, you've got a videographer on staff who, who does a great job at, at shooting video and picking up those kind of stories. But you also have a tremendous amount of photographs, right? A lot of mm -hmm. posts with photos as well. And are you training APS personnel to take better photos for social? Because I know you're not taking all those pictures and maybe your team isn't either. Maybe it's the community managers in different locations, but there's a lot of photos and I'm just not sure where they all come from and how they all get to be pretty good. I take all of those, Jay. How dare you? <laughs> you just no. travel around the state with an iPhone and, uh, and that's it. <laughs> that's all I do. No, we actually do do simple trainings. Like when you're taking a picture, hold your phone like this, not like this. Just those basic ones. For Instagram, we've been very clear with employees that a lot of that is crowdsourced. Hey, yeah. you guys work in every corner of Arizona. We don't. And it doesn't have to be work specific. It could be a sunset while you're out restoring power lines. So it's basically our message there and our goal on Instagram is very much like a travel magazine. We live, work, and play in Arizona. We love being here and our, our channel reflects that. So those folks, what I've noticed on Instagram is there's a lot of photographers or wannabe photographers, weekend photographers that work here. And yeah. I have just reached out to them and said, please follow us, tag us. And then I ask for permission and use it. And yep. so I not only amplify their pictures in the beauty of Arizona, but amplify them. Um, if they have a photography business, I have no problem linking to that. I mean, there's just all kinds of win-wins in that yeah, situation. So then the community affairs managers, we've given them the same training. So when they're out in Prescott and Yuma and Douglas, they're taking pictures that they can just text to me. So if I'm on duty over the weekend and there's an electric light parade, my phone will start dinging around 6 p.m. once it gets dark and all those photos are coming in. I can pick out the best. I have the editing tools if I need to lighten it or do different things and then post that on. But a lot of it, I love taking pictures. I've been in internal communications for over 20 years, lots of corporate storytelling. It was um, before video, so we just relied heavily on photos. So I just learned what I could and then, um, and then have found people who are, are similar minded and have a, an eye for that kind of thing and then set them loose. When you're thinking about the editorial calendar and, and what's going out there in social, mm -hmm. is it, here's what the story is, because this fits into our master kind of communications narrative and strategy. And so let's go find video or create video or find photos or create photos to support that narrative. Or do you look and see, here's all the photos and videos that are being crowdsourced that are out there. Oh, that's a good one. Let's tell that story. You know what I'm saying? Do, yeah. do we start with story or do we start with the, the asset and then make it a story? I would say it's, it's um, the bones is a plan and then there's a bunch of pockets in between for spontaneity. I think it'd be super boring if it was just all plan. And I think everyone on my team would get pretty burned out pretty fast. And so for Rachel and I, especially the videographer and myself, we can be reactive. We had a situation this summer where um, somebody posted on social, hey, APS, you have a cat on top of a pole. And that was it. Like, when are you going to come catch it? So then... <laughs> no, um, no idea of what pole? No pole. No, no, no. And so then we get another one. Okay, for, that's the canary in the coal mine. I'm like, okay, well, that's not our job to get a cat off a pole. You know, so I just let it go, put no response necessary. Well, we got another one. And I realized, okay, so I alerted our media team. She called one of the transmission distribution guys and said, hey, we could use a good story right now. We were in the middle of a political issue that was really negative and we needed the good story. And so, of course, our T&D guys don't want to go because you don't want to set a precedent like, hey, if your cat's up a pole, I'll call APS. You can't because they're out putting wires up and all kinds of stuff. Again, I don't know what I'm talking about, what they do. But um, so they, she called and she said, look, we really need this story. So they sent a truck over and the guy kind of grumbling to himself got up in the ladder. None of this you could see on pictures. The pictures were beautiful. Video was great. He gets up there, gets the cat down step by step. We have every picture. He hands it to this little girl who's just a huge smile with her little Princess Poppy was the name of the cat. And that thing exploded. Found out Princess Poppy was a boy. We didn't we didn't tell anybody that because that just got really, it muddied the water all over the place. But it was a story with legs for weeks. 
the news picked it up, all kinds of people picked it up. And another thing that came into play here was that while our media folks were on the phone, they were getting a call from the media saying, hey, we saw that on Twitter that there's a cat up the pole. Are you going to do anything? So it, the, it's just so fast. And so we had plans for that day and we just scrapped all of them because who cares about battery storage when you got Princess Poppy, the yeah. male cat on top of a pole and a lineman about to go up and get Princess Poppy. So in that instance, we have definitely pillars that we're trying to hit. We have four pillars that we're moving into 2019 with, but you know, they're not sexy. So when you have other things that come up that are really just even giving away the bikes or, um, or a storm, when you've got storm pictures, it's amazing if you put up a thing saying, a tweet that just says, we have uh, 14,000 people out in Flagstaff, look at our outlet, our, um, our excuse me, outage map for yeah. details. That's one thing. If you put up a picture of, our, of the damage and then another picture of the guys restoring it, people just completely go silent and are like, please be careful, please be safe. They'll lose their mind if there's not a picture because they don't know what's going on. So they'll be like, get my power back on, all my stuff in my refrigerator's going rotten. As soon as you put up a picture and say, we're doing the best we can to work quickly and safely, it completely calms the situation. So a lot of our plans either go by the wayside for good because we've lost the, the shelf life of them, or we just put them on for a few days later. So we're very, you have to be super nimble around this because you never know what's going to happen. Um, I kind of love and hate that in this job because for somebody who's not super flexible and, and coming from internal communications, I did everything by a plan. That's been an adjustment for me because I always had a long uh, lead time to a different project that I was writing for. And now you don't, you just got to uh, think on your toes and, and, Usually it's a gut reaction, like this is going to be a great story. And then sometimes you once in a while have a, you know, you put it up there and think it's fabulous and nobody responds. So you learn from that and decide, let's go a different direction. Did I answer I, your question? That was perfect. Okay, cool. Eileen Burmeister, social media consultant for Arizona Public Service. You have just articulated, I think, the third rule of issues in crisis communication. Uh, my, my, my experience in education and PR means there are always two, two rules for, uh, for crisis communications. Rule number one, communicate early. Rule number two, communicate often. Rule number three is add a picture. Because yes. I think you are so right in how that can change an entire dialogue, a temperature of a, of a situation. Yeah. I think that's really, really keen insight. I'm curious kind of about that insight. You mentioned that you have been doing internal communications for 20 years. Yeah. And I'm curious how that has affected how you approach social media, because I think, I think it does. I'm, I'm probably leading the witness here a little bit, but I think yeah. doing internal communications and recognizing you've got a lot of stakeholders, even at APS, you've got, as you said, you've got your, your lines people, you've got your executives, you've got your customer service, you've got all these different types of people and you've got to communicate with them. Talk a little bit about kind of your background in internal communications yeah. and how you think that experience really kind of set you up to be as effective a social media professional as you are. Okay. Um, I was in the timber industry before I came to APS. I lived in Oregon and worked at a company there that had um, 3,000 employees across the U.S. and a lot of timberland. So political issues are not new to me. We were at ground zero for the Spotted Owl controversy when that occurred. Uh, timber issues were huge. So all of that is, is uh, in my background, and I was able to lean on that moving into this position. But um, it also is very heavily on you lean very heavily on storytelling. Everything is a story. A photo is a story in and of itself. So internal is basically propping up the people who deserve to have a spotlight on them and telling their story when they can't put words to it themselves. So it's giving them a platform to shine in a way that advances your company um, in various ways. But in in for internal, you have different objectives than you do for external. And that's been an adjustment for me. When I first came to APS, I was on the internal team as a business partner, was working with our fossil plants and also working with our sustainability group. A year and a half ago is when I switched into social. Now, when I was at my internal job in Oregon, I also did handle social because it was a small enough department that I kind of did everything there. But I handled social at a very small level. It was a new channel. Um, it was business to business. It didn't have a lot of customer interaction because we were basically selling to like, you know, uh, Home Depot and different places like that. And then people would buy it from there. So it's a completely different beast to where customers are interacting with you like we are now. But the ability to tell stories the same. 
it's just really being strategic about what story, what platform, and how do you want the story to um, be told in what it could be something as simple as an interview, but it could be a picture, it could be a video, and telling stories not only in the format, but also compelling that people would care about. People are, uh, again, I know I said that they wanna know what's in it for them, but a rule of thumb that I always run any social media post back is like, who cares? Basically, why should I even care about this picture or this video or this, offer that you have for a smart thermostat. Why should I even care about that? So starting from that point and then going into the storytelling is key, especially on social, because you've got them for this amount of time or they're gone. Yeah. And you don't have that in internal. You have room to breathe. And, and Facebook is a little bit more that way. I, I, you can get a little, you can get away with a little bit of a longer breathe on those stories as well. But man, Twitter and Instagram, they are just scrolling right through. And if you don't capture them, then they're gone. So I think it's just learning how to tell your story. I will talk anyone's ear off and get to my point as quickly as possible. I've always been that way. So I think that's been an advantage moving into it here. Um, I think our T and D guys, the, the transmission distribution guys, they send us pictures from the field immediately and they know how to tell a story. They know exactly what they're doing and what's going to resonate with the customers and they send it to us and it's beautiful. It may not be great quality, but it's good storytelling. So I think it's when you're, when you're close and you feel passionate about what you're doing, then it shows in the product that you have. I know you used to be passionate about uh, rock and roll and that you were a singer in a rock and roll band when you were in high school, Eileen. And yeah. before I ask you the two questions that we ask every guest here on the Social Post podcast, I thought maybe you could just give us just, just a line or two, maybe some sort of, you know, give me some sort of like a uh, Aerosmith or, or something. You just yeah, I'm, to... I'm not going to do that, but I will tell you that I tried out for the band with a Def Leppard song and I killed nice. it. Nice. So that gives nice. you a little indication. We were yes. not a garage band. We were a carport band. It's not as cool but they didn't have a full garage. So we had to yeah. make do with what we had. Well, you get more breezes that way. You do. A band. It's, it's, it's <laughs> In Ohio. In Ohio. <laughs> Eileen, what one tip would you give somebody who's looking to become a social pro? I would say, oh, it's so funny. It's just what we were talking about. Read all the time. I go to bed every night reading. I think the more I read, the better writer I am, the better storyteller I am, the more I can craft a message uh, within five minutes because I read really good quality. So I think that's one and write as much as you can. I think without the ability to tell a story well and to write a story well, it's very hard to transition that into social media. Um, again, I think you're going to be tempted to get into the weeds. You're going um, to tell a message that nobody's asking for. So understanding story and what resonates with people is the key to that. Well, that was well said. Couldn't agree more. Last question for Eileen Burmeister, who's the social media consultant, Arizona Public Service Company. If you could do a video call with any living person, Eileen, who would it be and why? I think it would be Tina Fey. Oh, I, nice. I nice. think she has the ability to, first of all, if you've read... Um, is it Bossy Pants? Yeah. Bossy if you've read Bossy Pants, the way she weaves the story is spectacular. I think she's really smart. And any interview I've seen with her, I'm just completely drawn to her personality. She seems extremely real, straight shooter, doesn't have any kind of veneer or facade going on, doesn't really care about the whole Hollywood and all of that, yeah. which is so refreshing. Um, and I, I just... I think it'd be super fun to have that video conversation with her. And she seems like the kind of person I'd want to hang out with. Yeah. All right, Adam, that's your assignment. Tina Fey. Tina Fey. This year yeah. on Social Pros. No, I, I, yeah, I, I would like to be on that one too. I'm a big <laughs> fan. My, my fiance is too. It's her favorite person. She would yeah. answer the question, Eileen, exactly like you. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's Maybe well your done. fiance and I need to go out for drinks then. There you, you go. Not Tina Fey. Go. Okay. Perfect. I'm up for it. Eileen, thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on all the success at APS. So great to work with you as well uh, on our team at Convince and Convert. Yeah. Really appreciate you taking the time to share your wisdom with us. Terrific, terrific advice. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Our pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget you can get this show 
on YouTube now. You can subscribe on our YouTube channel. Obviously, you can subscribe to the show if you haven't already in all the places and ways that podcasts can be subscribed to, whether that's iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, etc. We would sure love you to do that to each and every one of our tens of thousands of listeners every week. Adam and I thank you for your support. And don't forget, each and every episode of the show now in our ninth year are at socialpros.com. Audio, transcripts, links, and goodness. On behalf of Adam Brown from Salesforce Marketing Cloud, I am Jay Baer from Convince and Convert, and we will be here next week on Social Pros. Mm-hmm.